New York and on the new Hot 97 app, Ebro in the Morning. On Hot 97. It's Ebro in the Morning, Laura Stiles, Rosenberg. Ow. We have, I, I consider him a friend. Bobby yes, Hunters is here. Absolutely. New, new book, book, Bobby. New this, book, Bobby. New this book, is Bobby. Not it's a official. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's up, Bobby? How are you? I'm good. I'm really good. I'm in the middle of this tour, and uh, it's it's maddening and overwhelming, but fun. Now, I bought your book, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Yeah. But I heard from a couple of people that you got really candid in the book. Yeah, it's pretty honest. I think it's uh, you know, in my it's vintage me. It's very transparent and and honest and real. And it's the story of us building this brand. And it's also the story of my life, but I'm no bones about it. I take you through all the highs and the lows and there's a lot more lows than there are highs for sure. One thing that, that I, uh, when I think of the hundreds, right? And it's so funny because yes, everybody knows the clothing brand, but I remember the blog. Yeah. Which was really special at the time because when blogs were a thing, right? Yeah, yeah, they yeah. were popping. And I always felt like the hundreds, it was so much more than just like a clothing brand. You guys built community. Yeah, that was so important to us and it still is. And that's really the ethos and the spirit of what the book is about is building a brand around cr community and also suggesting that perhaps there can be an alternative to brand building and business building as far as it's not just about profits and it's not just about capitalism, making money, it's it can be used as a tool to bring people together, which I did early on around my blog, and this was pre-social media, right? Then social media came around. Right. Pre-social media, what's that? Uh, right, yeah. Is there life? When did, when did you guys kick off? Like in 2000? 2003. Okay, 2003. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were 23 years old, <sighs> and I had already had a blog going at that time where it was just a daily journal and just photographing, documenting my life and the culture and the lifestyle that we lived. And then I just tied it and married it to product. And so if you wanted to participate in this scene that we were a part of, you can buy our clothes and feel like you're a part of our world. And how, and the, and the brand's done pretty well. The brand is done pretty okay, I think. <laughs> it's, it's gone through its ups and downs and we're back on another up over the last two or three years. So that's been fun. But I feel like I felt it all. You know, How do you a, get out of the downs when a brand goes down? When a brand's because, not as hot? Is, I, I, didn't you have a store here in New York? Yeah. We did. At one point. And it's then, not here anymore. Yeah. We shut that, that down two down years period. ago. That right. was probably near the end of the down period. And that took um, basically us just taking a scythe and trimming all the fat of the company. And so that's one way to do it is to cut fast and cut deep and to conserve your resources and figure out get, getting back to the DNA and the and the spirit of what the brand was about, which for us was collaboration-driven, online-driven, community-driven. And I think we had lost a lot of that along the way of expanding really quickly. A lot of energy got thrown at, at us at the same time, and I think we got a little bit too big, too fast for us, and now we're at a more measured pace. That makes sense with how we like to do things. I just remember back in the days, people being fans of the hundreds. Like, I don't know, how did like Jonah Hill and, and people like Kid this Cudi is, connect with you? This is a great example of the power of our community. Just uh, the nature of the culture around our shop at the time in LA. Jonah Hill lived next door. And Jonah okay, Hill's okay, apartment okay. used to be Seth Rogen's apartment. They wrote Knocked Up and and uh, um, super bad oh, out of wow. that apartment. And so because we had such a vibrant scene around our shop and kids were skating and smoking and riding bikes, Jonah was always around. Seth Rogen, Seth Rogen was around. Kid Cudi would come and hang out. Kid Cudi came in one day and he dropped his card and he said, everyone, I'll spend thousands of dollars. He bought everybody's clothes in the store. And that was par for the course at the time for what the scene was like, early streetwear, early Fairfax. Everyone knew each other. Everyone mm -hmm. was familiar with each other and supported each other. And out of that, we got the Tylers and we got a, right. a whole new generation of streetwear brands like Carrots um, that were inspired by what was happening on that block. And to me, that's the essence of true streetwear. That's the essence of what the hundreds was and always stood for as well. It is interesting. It speaks to, like, I always talk about how the L.A. in terms of hip-hop is you would think L.A. would be one thing because we think about Hollywood. But yeah. from a hip-hop standpoint, it's actually the exact opposite. It's always had the most vibrant underground 
the hip hop scene to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, in North America, and it's interesting that when you think about streetwear, it's the same thing. Yeah, of course. Like you would really think New York would be the streetwear spot, but it's not. Honestly, Fairfax. It's one of them. It's but, one of them, know. but I would say Fairfax is more impactful than New York. Maybe New York spread out more. It's just not the same. There's not one place where everyone all gathers. Well, Supreme was that in the '90s, though. Yeah, that's yeah. arguable, and it's yeah. also generational, right? So if you were to ask me. Just because my frame of reference is always the 90s and the early 2000s, New York was always king when it came to streetwear. Right. In a young person's eyes today, I think through the lens of a teenager in 2019, they're probably looking more at Fairfax than I did looking at Harajuku, let's say, mm -hmm. right? Harajuku was like the peak. But they were still inspired by what was happening in New York. Like Nigo was being inspired and referencing what was happening in New York. So the heart of street culture to me has always come back to New York, right? The attitude and hip hop and hip hop. If you reference hip hop, you have to talk about New York. Well, it's interesting. But it's interesting. That's part. the same thing with underground hip hop. So yeah. even with underground hip hop, though, New York was sort of the heartbeat of it. But the people who were obsessed with consuming it and really kind of keeping it going. A lot of it's always been in L.A. Yeah, there it's true. Always has been a lot. It's like true, you could yeah. do an. Un there are underground artists who are from New York who will play a show here and no one would be here, and then go to L.A. and there'd be people who are like, maybe it's the fact that L.A. is far away and people are a little bit more um, uh, excited to participate because yeah. it was slightly removed. Maybe I think it could have to do with just the layout of the city or the way the diversity works within the city, and there's just space for things to breathe. But we had such a we have such an, an incredible intersection of cultures and diversity of like ethnic heritages that I think that that has all fed into and fueled what the the kaleidoscopic streetwear culture looks like. Right, like I think. So much of streetwear is based around this collision of skate culture, surf culture, hip hop culture. It's not just black culture. It's not just Puerto Rican culture, white culture, Asian culture, Japanese culture. It's all of it mixed in together and crystallized into some, that something that is basically sold as just t-shirt graphics at the end of the day. You know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Brands like the hundreds, though, like when I think about them, it just you you have like this slight like this emotional connection to it, right? Yeah. But with, it's just hard for me because now I see you know people popping up with t shirt brands and and streetwear brands left and right. Do you feel like do you see the same passion in in in, in the newer ones? Because to me, it's like the reason I purchased like a Supreme or or like other hundreds is because it just brings me back to my childhood. Yeah. But I don't know if. Will this generation feel the same? I think they do, but I think it's more granular and nuanced. And everyone now has their own cultural touchstone in their own yeah. communities, their own brands, right? Like if you went out to certain parts of Chicago, they might be speaking about a brand called Half Evil or Joe Fresh Goods. And to them, that is their version of it. The Hundreds are Supreme. Whereas back when we were starting, everyone was really only looking to LA, New York, some San Francisco brands, and you know maybe Tokyo brands and London brands. But if you were to say, hey, there's this really cool brand coming up out of New Orleans or Boise, Idaho, mm -hmm. it would seem crazy. But there are really big resonating brands that are popping off in these smaller neighborhoods now. So I think it's just fragmented just along with the rest of the internet. And it's not just about five brands anymore. Now it's right, about right, right. five million brands. Um, so I don't know. Everything's happening much faster now. Yeah. And speaking of letting, giving things room to breathe – I don't feel like brands don't have that space to grow and to be organic in terms of their trajectories anymore. I feel like it's very fast and sudden because of their Instagram communities. You right, can so that you, build a following very quickly. Yeah, you have one hot post that gets reposted and before, before you know it, even if you're not ready to be in that spot yet, mm -hmm. if the right thing goes up, it's now most, you're out of here. Never and most it. brands are not ready for that spot. So we see a lot of brands kind of blow up and blow out too fast. Even for us, we've been around for 15, 16 years, and sometimes it feels like it escapes me because the hype and the momentum can get so out of control, and we have to catch up to that, which I address in the book as well. A lot of our downturns were because we weren't just prepared infrastructurally for the growth that came along with our business. I remember you tweeted um – Support black-owned streetwear brands somewhere yeah. along those lines. Yeah. You, why Why did you decide to tweet that at that time? Because when I saw that and I had a conversation with one of my girlfriends where we were discussing that, she's like, you know, I she's been 
toying with the idea of starting her own, right? She's like, why isn't there any more, you know, female-owned streetwear brands besides yeah. Married to the Mob? You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And she's like, we're black-owned. And then, like, maybe, like, two days later, I, I saw you tweet that. Yeah, um, and it was funny the response I got to that, right? It was very much like a all lives matter response right, right, kind right. of like right, came right, back right. at me. Like, well, what about, they're like, Bobby, you're Korean. What about the Korean street events? And I'm like, support them too. But right now in this moment and in this space, what I'm addressing is the fact that we have forsaken black-owned streetwear brands. We haven't given them the proper representation. When we've borrowed and stolen so much from black culture in telling the streetwear story over the years. And again, the streetwear story isn't just the black story, right? There's so there's Chicano's stories in there. There's um, white surf culture, beach culture can be argued as being really the DNA of where streetwear started from. Sean Stussy and all the surfboard shapers that he looked up to when he was starting, right? But... I've always felt like it was so ironic that black culture is such a strong theme throughout everything that we're designing and creating, yet there's very little ownership, black ownership, black executive right. positions, um, black females, right? Especially and so much of our style and attitude is taken from black women. Yes. And you don't see them anywhere in space, right? For generations. I worked on a streetwear documentary called Built to Fail, which we're still trying to figure out how to put out. But in that movie, if you watch it, there's very few black people. And it's not for a lack of trying. It's just that they were not necessarily included in the conversation. And so in that moment for that tweet and that Instagram post, I had to just let it be known, like, we got to talk about this. This is something that is a little uncomfortable even for me to say. And I see that reaction coming back to me more and more as the years go by of, hey, you're great and all, but you know you're taking from black culture and what are you doing for the black community. And it's something that I like to be mindful of. And I feel like the rest of the streetwear community should be mindful of as well. Well said. And um, yeah, it's, it's just so often that, and, you know, I can relate it to even um, to my interest in the culture. It's just so common that both like Jewish and Asian people took to hip hop culture, mm -hmm. got into it and got into it really hard. Right? <laughs> and it yeah. came and it came from a really pure place. And the right. goal is like, I just want to participate and I want to help and I want to yeah. be a part of it. Yeah. But then ultimately you turn around and you're like, well, I'm also in it now and I'm making money from it. And yeah. I'm doing all this stuff. And it's like, what are you doing to help ensure that other people are also doing that? Because we come Absolutely. into it, and I can't speak for your background, but we come into it, you know, Roger, for example, who we just did an interview with about why you were sleeping, loved graffiti culture, mm -hmm. yeah. came from the suburbs in Bethesda Maryland, where he was able to come in with a little bit of privilege, start his own business, and start with a leg up. So yeah. already now you're able to do business, whereas the kids in the hood maybe who were participating when they were really young aren't able to do that. So right. I think it's important that you deliver that message. That's yeah. I feel like I've spent so much of my career in life talking about brand building and working on brand building. And at some point this year, I woke up and said, well, it's been 15, 16 years now. What do you do when you've actually built a brand? What do you do with it? And for us, what that means is providing a platform for others to cultivate cultivate their dreams, to put us a, a spotlight on issues that we are advocating at the time. And, you know, for that reason, it might be promoting black owned streetwear brands, black driven streetwear brands. And this uh, week at Complex Con Chicago, we're collaborating with Joe Fresh Goods, Lena Waith, um, Bricks and Wood, which is a, a black owned streetwear brand out of South Central, our friend Casey Lynch runs. And so that wasn't by virtue of us being like, we have to find black brands to work with. It just so happens to be right now also that the coolest brands are really majority black owned. The One of the biggest brands out of LA is a brand called FTP that Zach mm -hmm. runs. And uh, I love that brand just by by the fact that the, the man who's running it is a black man. And, um, and the following and the kids look like him, right? Like now it's all starting to make sense. It's not like two people, someone's selling to someone that's not endemic or or looks like the person that they're, they're inspired from or stealing from. It's like, we're all in this together at that point. So I wanted to see more of that. I feel like we can do that in the Asian community and the brown communities. I feel right. like we can do that for skate brands. You know, like skaters want brands to be owned by skateboarders, right? It's the same thing. It's like you don't know what it's like to be a skater unless you skate. So why don't, doesn't that make sense for many other identities and many other affiliations? I feel like skaters don't appreciate me enough because I don't skate. Oh, God. You know? <laughs> what am I feeling? Um, the book is out right now. It's called This Is Not a T-Shirt. 
Bobby Hundreds. Thank you for uh, coming in and making some time. Yay, Thank you Bobby. so much. Get Love the, the show. Book. Thank you.